Good afternoon. I'm sorry, but we have to start the next session. So I invite you to sit down, please. And I would like to invite our speakers to come and sit, please. So we have two missing speakers. <laughs> we know they're here, but in the facilities, but um, okay, we, uh, let's, we can start without them because the, we're literally counting the minutes. So um, good afternoon again. My name is uh, Marie-Laure Le Mineur and uh, I work for ECPA International. We are a network of NGOs uh, specialize in combating sexual, all forms of sexual exploitation of children. Our headquarters are based uh, in Bangkok and we have more than 100 uh, members uh, all over the world and uh, uh, I wish to acknowledge um, a representative from ECPAC France here. Thank you for coming. Um, so today we're going to discuss on this panel um, digital platforms, uh, online games and uh, the impact on um, children and how vulnerable they are. Um, so as I said, we, two speakers are still missing. I hope they'll be joining shortly. Um, uh, we, what we will do is that I'll briefly introduce you uh, um, to each of the speakers. Then uh, I'll ask, uh, we'll sort of uh, ask questions uh, that we uh, agreed on and um, to raise specific aspects around the topic I just mentioned. And then we will open the floor about 10 minutes so that we can take questions and then we will wrap up. And it goes very fast because it's basically 60 minutes, as I said, uh, so it's a short session. So uh, with us today we have Jutta. And uh, Jutta Kroll is uh, from Germany, and is a project manager for a foundation called Digital Opportunities uh, Foundation based in uh, Germany, but also she's the chairperson of the board of this foundation, if I'm not mistaken. And Jutta is also a board of, uh, sorry, a member of the MAG. Um, so she's very uh, well versed in all of those topics and very uh, familiar with the IGF. We also have John Carr. Um, John uh, is an advisor and consultant with INASCO, with ECPA International and uh, many other uh, regional mechanisms, uh, Council of Europe and act as an expert with companies um, and, and wears many hats. He's a well-known expert in China online protection and sexual exploitation of children. And finally, we have uh, Patrick Mead. Uh, who is representing the private sector, a company is ch chief technical officer, CTO of uh, Dubit. This is how you pronounce it. Oh yeah. That. <laughs> and is a UK com a company based in the UK, which is uh, designs uh, online platforms, apps um, for children, and uh, also um, cooperate with many. Hello, Martin. <laughs> cooperate with many uh, companies like uh, Disney and etc. but I'm sure he will share more information about that. And on my right hand side, uh, we have Martin Butterman, who is um, a, board, a member of the board of ICANN, so he knows a lot about DNS, uh, which is not really the topic today, but Martin also is, are you the chair of the uh, Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things? Um, so, uh, again, he knows a lot about uh, Internet of Things and, and we've been discussing the linkages with, uh, um, you know, you, children as users. 
And uh, when the you know, missing speaker joins us, then maybe she can introduce herself. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, as I said, I'm going to ask um, a question, and the first question w uh, would be, in the first place, why do you think, why do we think it's important to um, even discuss screen time exposure or internet time use, uh, um, you know, by children as users and, and, and its impact on, on children? Why is, is this important? I would like to hear the views of the, uh, of the panelists. I don't know, Judah, if you want to start. Yes, of course, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for giving me the floor first. Uh, I do think the discussion of screen time started when children began watching television, so it's not a new discussion about what screen time uh, exposure is, is right for children or wrong, but uh, I do think with the uh, um, event of the internet, uh, the discussion has completely changed. Now that it's not only being exposed to the screen, which is in the term screen time exposure, but it's interaction with the screen, and that means also interaction with the other users behind, somehow behind that screen. So, uh, and talking about interaction with what is on the screen and what children are doing there, we know that certain threats come along with this type of interaction. And one of these threats that is related to directly interacting with the screen being somehow drawn into what is happening on the screen and, and performing, for example, games, tasks, and so on. I, 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 I would leave it at that point to give my other uh, panelists room to, to answer your question as well. Thank you, Yuta. Anything else you want to add? Yes, yeah, so um, I think it's important because of the speed of the evolution of these screens and the screen time as well. So we started developing um, virtual worlds quite a while ago, um, which were predominantly online, single screen. It's just your PC. Obviously, the gateway to a PC was slightly higher back then as well. Um, but over time, now we're seeing you know, tablets in children's hands younger. We're seeing um, phones, watches that are smart watches. We're also seeing VR and AR experiences, so that entirely new screens. Um, and I think it's important to have this discussion because the speed at which no, uh, yeah, VR being virtual reality and AR being augmented reality, um, where VR will be putting on a headset, looking around and seeing an entirely new reality, um, where augmented reality will be things like Pokemon Go, where you get your phone out and you can see the street, but you can also see small little digital creatures. Um, and it's, it's really important to have these discussions on the, the impact of this on children simply because of, of that speed of evolution and every time we have this discussion there'll be something new to discuss and, and there'll be complacency um, in the industry if we don't keep doing so. And so we think it's important, especially from the private sector, to make sure that we keep looking behind the curtain into that black box of technology um, that people often don't quite understand, um, making people aware of it and, and what actually we are doing that might be impacting children. Thank you, John. Okay. Parents worry. I mean, it's kind of part of the territory. If you're a parent, you worry about your children. It doesn't, I can remember, you know, when our children were very young, they'd start having a, a, t a, a tantrum because I wouldn't give them a banana. And I would worry, maybe if I give in and give them the banana, this is the moment. This is the fork in the road that means that they will inevitably grow up to be a mass murderer or, or vote for Donald Trump or something horrible like that. Um, so, <laughs> so, of course, when something new comes along, something like augmented reality, virtual reality, scre screens that can do things that you never experienced when you were a child, then naturally parents worry, and it's right that they should worry. It's, not, it's right that they should be concerned and interested about what's happening to their children, in, the, to the, in their children's lives. Uh, the problem is, of course, some of these worries become completely exaggerated and become disproportionate uh, and can have negative uh, outcomes and negative effects. The simple truth is, games and most, and most of the online platforms that our children engage with 
for most of the time, for most of the children, will be a positive thing and a fun thing. Uh, and there's, there's lots of research emerging about how certain kinds of games help children with problem solving, with analysis, with planning for the future and things of this kind. So there are lots and lots of benefits associated with, with some of these platforms and some of the games, particularly the sort of stuff that Dubit, uh, Dubit has been uh, working on. But there are downsides. If you, if you were to ask a typical school teacher in England, for example, which is where I live, uh, one of the things they would say that they're most concerned about is sleeplessness. Kids coming into school in the morning not having had a good night's sleep. Why? Because they're on their phones or their games consoles doing stuff when they ought to be sleeping and getting a good night's sleep. And you can't learn properly at school if you haven't had a good night's sleep. So that's a bit of it that's genuine and real, um, and we ought to find a way of addressing it. Thank you. Martin, do you want to add something on this? Uh, yes, maybe. Uh, just to open the, the, the mind, uh, John already provided a little insight there. Uh, one thing is the, the, the pure screen time. The other one is what you do with the internet. And in that, I uh, want to uh, yeah, just raise the point that what we do with the internet may be less and less fire that screen, but in other ways uh, also for children to open a mind for that. The second thing for me is that um, next to screen time as such, most importantly, it's what we do with that screen. And, and uh, in that, uh, and particular to children, uh, that there's transparent and responsible offering via that screen is also, uh, also crucial. Uh, and we need to protect these users more than other users. Thank you. Um, so ne my next, next question would be, is there such a thing as, as the right amount of exposure to in internet use in terms of hours or screen is exposure? Can we, can we sort of, you know, uh, make these statements? I would say the first question is to answer how we measure the screen time. So uh, um, there is a research company called Common Sense who have just published new stats on children's exposure to, to screens and they, their method is to measure each screen separately. That means if a child, which, which we often see, sits in front of a computer, has their smartphone probably beside them, and also the TV is running in the room, then it would be not one hour exposure, but three hours of exposure. You can question that methodology, but in the end, we see that children are doing this. They are interacting with several devices, and it depends on the services they use on the device. It depends how much they are drawn into what they are doing there on that device, how much they engage with the game or with the communication with other people or with the content that is provided to them. So, and I would not say uh, that it's possible to define a right amount of screen time. It depends on what services are used. So it's not so much about the quantity, but the quality. It's about the quality, the quality of the content, but also the quality of the interaction. And uh, we will come to the point to discuss how, if it's a voluntary decision of the child to interact this amount of time with the service they are using, or whether they are drawn into continuous interaction with the game or with the service, or also with their communication partners. This is linked to one of the points you were making earlier that there are the trend is to have multiple screens and multiple platforms or devices and, and is that correct? Yeah, so, um, and, and I agree with, with Yuta that it's, it's hard to define exactly what the right amount of time is. We, we can quite easily um, observe the extremes. So we know when, you know, there's absolutely too much um, or when there's too little and we're taking it, we're detracting value from children by them not seeing any screens or being um, exposed to any technology because they need to build up resilience through life and actually learn about these things. Um, but defining where that lands in between is very hard. And I think the main thing to do is recognize that 
what's actually happened over time isn't that we've just decided to use more screen time, it's that we've replaced functions with screen time. So communications, which were done over telephone, replaced with the screen, um, reading about things, learning, homework, replaced with the screen. And these are all things that add value. But there are other things that that then exposes, which are not necessarily positive value. And I think it's that balance between those two that's really important here. Um, and what we find is the conflation with the two come from what you're trying to achieve when you're building your apps and software. So for us as children specialists, we're trying to build a good user experience that's at the forefront of our mind. Building in fun or education, um, a obvious transaction of value between the parent and the provider. Um, and then the opposite sort of extreme side of that is when everything's slightly more opaque. So you've got um, parents suddenly don't know what the value is and, and we're talking here sort of towards the ad revenue side of things um, which is it's hard to see what that provides why the content is of any quality and quite often the incentives to make the content quality of a decent quality um, don't align with the model the business model being used so um, just to clear that point up a little bit it is that Generally, if you start, off, start out with a good business model, um, one that tries to aim to add value, you end up in a place where you're giving children benefits through screen time. And I think that's the main thing we're trying to do at Dubit, the main thing we're trying to do with our clients. You talk to some uh, parents sometimes and that you get the impression that they think every minute the child spends looking at the screen is a wasted minute. You know, if they weren't looking at the screen, they'd be playing football, climbing a mountain, saving somebody's life, out collecting money for fighting diseases in uh, some exotic parts of the world. So, and it's a completely false idea and a false understanding of how children are reacting with, with screens. If you were on your screen fundraising to fight diseases in different parts of the world or you know campaigning against a particularly horrible mayor in your city or something like that so in other words what we need to do in a way is get parents and teachers to understand better the rich variety of different things that children can do but having when they're on the screen and simply seeing a child in front of a screen doesn't and shouldn't automatically lead you to think oh my god why aren't they playing soccer? Why aren't they at the swimming pool? Or why aren't they doing something different? Or how? Apart from anything else, certainly in an English school, it's impossible to imagine how a child can do their homework these days or any of their sort of real assignments without going online, without looking at a screen. And the complexity of the homework projects could mean you have to be you know, on, on the screen for an hour just to do one essay or one, one assignment. Um, so how, again, would you judge? So I think it's about really... Uh, improving people's understanding but but the basic the, the, pr the basic point is we still don't know enough about the long-term consequences of this new type of engagement and so it's understandable we shouldn't be harsh we shouldn't be critical or snooty or superior about saying to a parent oh well you're just stupid you don't understand the modern world it's natural and normal parents to be anxious and to, uh, about what their children are doing uh, and we need to find ways of communicating that to them but in the meantime I perfectly understand why people think you know at a certain age being on you know I, I'm not exact, exactly sure what the state of the research is and the American Association of Pediatrics said something recently about zero screen time below the age of two uh, and some, uh, some different sort of level up to the age of six. I, I've kind of lost track of it. I'm not sure what the numbers are. I'm not sure that there is any fixed, there's no certainties about any of this. That being the case, you can understand why people would want to be cautious and adopt the precautionary principle and be more conservative rather than uh, more radical, if you see what I mean. Um, just to jump back in there on the, the point about um, children, in, in the UK using tablets, etc., for homework. Um, and quick disclaimer, we, we run something called 
um, the trends tracker, which includes 18,000 parents and children a year, um, and it, it, it tracks um, trends on digital, include uh, digital and traditional media um, for children, um, and we, we push that data out to different um, vendors in the world. Um, we actually found that one of the sharpest increases, and I don't have the exact stats on me, but one of the sharpest increases in use of tablets for children was in learning and homework um, overall other increases. So children are already on tablets, as you might imagine, playing games, using other kinds of apps. But certainly over the last year, our last set of trends, we run them every six months. Um, we're finding that the, the biggest increase in uptake of tablets for children um, is, is in doing homework, which is quite nice to see. Um, and then we take something like that and we use that data with our clients to suggest as kids experts what, how they should be providing content to children. Um, so for instance, where we've released um, Big Minnow Learning, which is in conjunction with the Montessori Foundation. Um, and that's an app that's all about counting numbers on the screen, very simple learning for preschoolers, um, can be guided, um, doesn't have to be. Um, and it's, it's again using technology because it uses AR, so it uses a camera to recognize the numbers that the, um, the user is pushing in front of the screen. Um, again, it's using technology to, to instill something that's of value for a child rather than, hey, this is just fun or yet another screen. Thank you. So I, I remember maybe one or two years ago uh, on the French uh, media, there was a call from, if I'm not mistaken, the Association of Pediatrician or at least some um, um, doctors saying that they were very concerned and they were um, starting um, to have uh, very young children patients who were showing signals of autism. Uh, I, maybe someone in, in, in the audience know better than me about that, but I remember clearly, um, uh, you know, them um, um, sort of trying to raise awareness around that as a result of being exposed to, um, to spend too, too many hours in front of a screen. Um, of course, as you said, John, uh, this is still sort of an unexplored territory and, and a lot more research needs to be done. But of course, um, even though we acknowledge that um, there is a benefit in using, uh, uh, in, in you know, having multiple functions uh, um, uh, as an internet user, and uh, uh, there are benefit to it. I'm going to be the devil's advocate and 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 sort of uh, also uh, maybe use common sense, even though it's not based on research that the human body and the human brain is not designed to be seated in front of a device for hours and hours. Um, basically, um, we already know that from, you know, um, some research around uh, watching too much television. So I'm just wondering, I'm just throwing that, uh, saying uh, maybe to the floor, changing plans, because it's, it's a, a, you know, controversial uh, topic. Maybe do you want someone from the floor wants to say something or has a strong opinion about that? Yes, please. Oh, Janice. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I have a very strong opinion about that. There has been a lot of research on neuroplasticity. And I think one of the big problems now is that children are watching very fast moving images and sounds and they're using the lateral lobes of their brains, which is detracting from the prefrontal development, which simply means the metacognition, the capacity for very young kids to take a step back and think about what they're doing. That's one side of it. The other side is the addictiveness. Um, because as we use our, our lateral lobes, we expect more and more, whereas if we're really analyzing text and trying to understand, or if we're involved in a discussion, then we're using very different parts of our brain. So I think that when we're talking about screen time, we do have to take this into account. And also the fact that there is a lot uh, more attention deficit problems now um, for this very reason that kids are jumping from one thing to the other. They're not going really into depth. 
if you want to read more about this, John, um, Nicholas Carr, yes, sorry, not John, Nicholas Carr um, has written a very interesting book called The Shallows, but there is where he, he talks about various research, but there is a lot more research in this area. And I think we should be thinking about this because not only are we changing customs and the way families interact, we are also changing the shape and the development of a child's brain. Is that a good or a bad thing? In my opinion, it's quite a difficult thing. There is some concern that we are going back to a stage of um, an oral society and uh, if a child is born deaf or in oral societies, there's a great difficulty in developing abstract operational reasoning, which usually comes around about age 12 or 13. So in my opinion, it's not a good thing, but maybe there are other people who can see advantages of, of this sort of shallow uh, reflection. Thank you very much, Anis. John wants to react to that. So, uh, just so, sort of along the same lines. I mean, there's certainly been research done in the UK. I can't instantly remember the author's name, but if anybody wants to follow up, uh, let me know and I'll get the references, which spoke about this thing around multitasking. You know, people say, oh, it's great. Kids are, can do two or three, four different things at once using different screens. And actually what this research tended to show was that whilst they're doing three or four, maybe doing two or three different things simultaneously, they're not doing any of them particularly well. And they're certainly not doing some of them to the, uh, to the highest peak of efficiency uh, that they would have done if they'd been concentrating on that task alone. But in the room is one of the most a great fount of knowledge, second only to myself. Uh, Larry Maggid, he was shaking his head or nodding or I'm not quite sure what he was doing when I mentioned the American Association of Pediatrics. It, it, it's always a rare pleasure to be able to contradict you, John. Um, I, I think the research, at least in the United States, is that they, when you're multitasking, what you're really doing is task switching. You're going back and forth between tasks as opposed to simultaneously doing things. You're doing so rapidly, it may seem like you're multitasking. But I'd just like to put in a word for today's generation of young people. You know, we see all of these books by Gene Twenge and others about the generation of today's youth essentially falling into the abyss and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But then you look objectively at young people today, the ones, some of whom are maybe not in this meeting but have, are here at the IGF. Uh, I was, when I saw the results of the students in Parkland, Florida, who were at the high school where the shooting was and how many of them rose to a position of national leadership literally overnight. I, I'm watching CNN and I'm watching a young man who had never been on broadcast television before. He had never been a spokesperson and he was better than I am and I've been on television hundreds of times. But then I realized he probably has been on television hundreds of times, not broadcast, but YouTube or Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And so I think that we are substituting, we are, we are experiencing some losses, I think Janet, articulates very very correctly, but I think we're also receiving some gains. And just as there is something to be said for the kind of intellectual uh, concentration focus that other generations may have had during their, their schooling where they would read long books, et cetera, there's also something to be said about the ability to rapidly acquire information, move back and forth. And if we look objectively at today's young people, I've yet to be convinced that this is a generation that has fallen into the abyss. Good point. Thank you. Yuta, want to react? Yes, I do think it's necessary for clarification that we do uh, remind ourselves that children are not all the same. And as this is especially uh, important in regard of this discussion we have now with regard to their age. So we all know that children are different at the age of two than at the age of 16, for example. And the benefits they can have from using digital devices. They, they grow as children are growing, so they would need more company, more guidance from parents or other caretakers at a younger age, and they, they can grow into somehow self-control uh, when, they, when they get older. But we don't know how much guidance we need to give them at which age, and we don't know most parents don't know how to do that because 
we don't know enough about the impact that using these devices uh, have on children's brains, on their behavior, on their whole development. So it, I do think we need an um, age differentiating approach to, to this situation. And what we face is that the applications, most of them, they don't do this age differentiation. So it's part of the educational process that parents know which type of application, which type of device and service is appropriate for their child at a certain age. Uh, but also it's part of the responsibility of those who produce the content, the applications, to take care of children's developmental process. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yuta. Those are uh, very good points um, uh, about the role of parents and the age differentiation. We're going to park this for the next question because we'll touch upon that. But before that, Massimo wanted to say something, the lady over there, and then there was a third person, and then a fourth. I'll, I'll ask you to be very brief, please, so that we can. Yes, <coughs> Giacomo <coughs> from the EBU for the workers. Um, we in the TB field, we have done a lot of research <coughs> about the, the impact of the screens. Uh, you have a lot of literature on that. Uh, what is interesting uh, and I think that need to be watched carefully for the future is about what happened when the 3D screens uh, and experience has been launched. We have seen that the syndrome that was we were mentioning before about the fast moving images were having a lot bigger impact than expected and uh, there were a lot of troubles created by that and in fact uh, the 3D are not working um, properly now and is not successful but with virtual reality and the enhanced reality this will become a bigger bigger problem so it need to be watched I think that we all lack really of researches on that I think that there is more need for uh, deep investigation about the the impact of the devices, the impact of the new kind of um, consumption, uh, the impact of the multitasking, etc., etc. For sure, what we can see is that there is a l lose of attention, lose of memory, and lose of contest. And the problem is that um, uh, more the, the, the additional problem that this happens in, in a situation in which you don't have um, already, in, as according to the age, uh, parameters to measure the uh, reliability of what you are watching uh, and the sources. And so probably we need to rethink based on the re assumption of this re research, also rethink the, the educational process because a certain number of things need to be incorporated in the educational curricula since the very first age. And for us as broadcasters, the main, uh, when we go online, the main problem is the age verification that uh, still remain a very huge issue. Thank you. Now I am worried because I can see I'm, I suffer from most of those symptoms. <laughs> uh, at the back, you wanted to say something. Um, hello, my name is Maria Stella. I'm a current student. Um, I graduated from Queen Mary University in law and I'm studying now media and communications. And I did a thesis basically on the impact of criminology and how this is related to media and children. And I wanted to follow up on the idea of addictiveness because basically I, what I found that is really um, uh, worrying is that children when they watch um, um, violent scenes on television or on movies because they identify with their heroes they become more violent as well and this was proven by many research and also many books academics spoke about it and I think this is a big concern and a concern of the future um, and also we talked about parents and children I think that parents and schools are the ones who are meant to protect children. But the problem is that often, unfortunately, parents and children lack communication. Um, children are vulnerable um, people and it's not always easy to talk with the parents. And for the parents, it's not always easy to like connect with their children. And this is something that we must take into consideration because maybe probably it's a, from a certain perspective a naive uh, vision of life but in order to solve um, difficult situations we must look at the basic of it and the basic is a relationship between parents and children or those who have responsibility to guide 
the children because they can't do it alone. So I think that maybe perhaps a solution would be work on that relationship in order to you know, make the situation better and protect these vulnerable individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Bef when we finish with uh, this round, we'll talk about the role uh, of different sectors, and including the parents. Yes, please, you, you, and then the last question over there. Hello, my name is uh, Francois. I'm a Mozillian from Paris. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in 1988, there is a French sociologist who explained us that uh, our body is the first door to life in general. We, is our first, through this device, the body, uh, we feel alive. We can enjoy ourselves. We can discover things. This is the first things we should possess. Uh, it's a treasure. So, as you can understand, I'm very concerned when I see very, very skinny, uh, more skinny than me, uh, more skinny uh, young people and uh, obsessed in South Korea, in Taiwan, or in Japan, and they have no social interaction at all. So, of course, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say I'm against Internet Extra. I love, I play games also, uh, and uh, I learned a lot of things. It's, a great, it's an amazing, a very powerful tool, of course. Uh, what I'm saying is um, that, for instance, uh, there is a problem when children have no relationship with, uh, with parents because uh, parents are not adults but children with the technological tools. It's a technological toy. They have become, parents have be also uh, co should be considered as kids, I think. They're not responsible. They are also addicted. So I'm wondering about the future generation. If there is no uh, communication between the parents and children, how will the children will be able to build themselves psychologically? And uh, we often repeat, oh, you know, uh, it's not, uh, it's not this is, you know, children when they are not using the screen, they are not saving the world, they are not climbing the mountains. Yes, of course, I, I, I agree with this generality. Uh, but the thing is, um, we need to own our body. We need, uh, for instance, to to feel things. It's the way to to dance. Also, it's the way to create new roads. Uh, in uh, in uh, recent uh, neurology uh, studies, uh, I, I could discover it. Um, and uh, unless you want society and the ch the youth to become cyborg, that's the road. Unless you want to have a an augmented life where bodies are uh, merchandised. So that's why I feel very, very concerned about education, the limits, and yes, education. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, I promise I will be brief. Um, so I'm Elizabeth Milovidov. Um, I'm an independent expert for the Council of Europe. And I just wanted to, to chime in because I actually run a Facebook group with parents. Um, and so one of the things I just wanted to say in to response to your question about um, the autism, it was called virtual autism. And with the original statistics, we found this in the United States with the Center for D Disease Control. In 1975, one in 5,000 children were diagnosed with autism. Uh, in 2005, it was one in 500. And then in 2014, it was one in 68. Um, what they did, the French doctors, um, they, didn't, they, didn't, uh, they then did a study, um, and they looked at it. There's an excellent YouTube video called Screens, Danger for Children uh, from Zero to Four. And what they found is that when they removed the screens from the children, the virtual autism disappeared. Um, that is what is uh, so very, very interesting to always uh, let parents understand, which is why I agree with Yuda's uh, remark about the age. We're not talking about 17-year-old children. We're talking about children that are much, much younger. Uh, and this can also be the problem because we know, as Janice had mentioned about the neuroplasticity, that small children's brains, they cannot develop without a sense of touch and interaction. That's it. That was brief. This is very useful information. Thank you very much. Last question before we move on to the next block. My name is Sandra Cortesi. I work at the Berkman Klein Center. Um, just uh, very brief. One, I, I do think that we should be careful with the term addiction. So far, it has not been registered as an actual disease or disorder, at least not by the AAP, which to me is uh, one entity for which I look, at which I look when looking for answers in the space. Um, I do think addiction is also a problematic term to use because if 
if we continue to use it on one side, uh, particularly for families, parents, they often use it too lightly, which uh, causes for me uh, questions for concern in terms of if they use it too lightly, will their children, if actually, if they have a problem, will they get treatment uh, or support quick enough? If actually young people are suffering um, from uh, problematic uh, screen use uh, and in that sense are addicted, will we stigmatize them by calling them addicts? Because usually we associate with the word addict, uh, drug addicts and so forth. And that in the case of children I find uh, quite problematic. Uh, and last point, if we are considering limiting screen time for young people and children, uh, will we potentially limit screen time for those who actually technology uh, serves as a lifeline? Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, young people with disabilities or uh, people that are underrepresented in the communities around them. Uh, and so let's think carefully before we over-regulate this. Thank you very much, Sandra. Certainly very valid points. So um, based on, 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 on the feedback and the, and the points uh, raised by the audience and the speakers previously, we can move on to discuss a little bit the, the role of, of, of uh, speak of solutions and, and or, or, you know, anticipate trains and, and, and uh, who, I mean, basically, who do you think has a share of responsibility when it comes to um, you know, um, tackling this problem. Uh, is it private sec parents only, uh, caretakers, caregivers, uh, private sector has a role to play, um, et cetera. Can you sort of elaborate a little bit on that? Perhaps go first. Um, well, there is this magical world, multi-stakeholderism. There's deep skepticism about what it actually means, but there's a core of an idea there that obviously parents and teachers have a part, but so do the companies themselves. And I don't know if, how many of you have seen the film made by Beban Kidron called In Real Life, in which she interviews uh, some professor of psychology at Yale, I think it was, or one of the Ivy League schools in the States anywhere. And, uh, anyway, and he said, some of the most highly paid, brightest psychologists that I've ever known and worked with are all now working in Silicon Valley, uh, for two, uh, principally because the amount of money they're getting paid by these big high-tech companies is enormous. And why are they paying these guys enormous amounts of money? It's because they want them to design systems, platforms, games, the way things are presented online, in a way to maximize user engagement which, by the way, was code for and a very ill-disciplined use of the word addiction. So in other words, stickiness, I think was what we used to call it ages ago. So the whole purpose of these really smart, clever guys was to design things, first of all, to attract you and then to keep you. And why? Because one of the things, of course, that generates money for these platforms is the data that is generated by the kind of engagement that then happens. So obviously, in my, in my, uh, I think the companies do have a responsibility in this space. I mean, Jutta made a very, very important point, reminding us earlier that every child is different. You, sh there are, you shouldn't have any hard and fast rules about these things. But even so, I do think companies have a responsibility. And I don't normally point to China as, an ex as a good example uh, of, well, a lot of things. But the Chinese, I note, and I'm not sure about the Koreans, I think somebody mentioned Korea earlier, they've introduced a law which, which says that you have to build in the law of diminishing returns into some of your games or platforms. In other words, the longer you play a game or the longer you are in, engaged in that kind of activity, interactive kind of activity, it should become harder for you to, um, to score points or win the game or progress to another level or something of that kind. So in other words, Built, they're requiring the games companies, the platform builders, to build in disincentives to keep you on for too long. Now, if, I haven't seen it, how it works in practice, I haven't seen the reality of it, but I kind of like the idea that somehow the games provider, the games writer is accepting they have some role to play in trying to uh, reduce the, the, the degree to which the, the stickiness that might apply to the to particular games or activities. 
Uh, I mean, we, we've all read about cases where young people have died. You know, they've been, and what, there was one guy who, who built a toilet. I mean, his, 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 his chair, you know, next to his computer was actually also a toilet because he didn't want to drag himself away from the game to relieve himself. That's not good. I mean, I'm not saying these are very common, obviously, uh, but we need to be mindful that, of these things. And, and bear in mind, my last point, these companies spend millions and millions and millions of dollars marketing their products, convincing you that you're not cool, you're not smart, you're not a dude, unless you're engaging with our game and part of our environment. And then to say, but actually then it's all down to the parents to make sure it doesn't go too far, seems to me wrong in principle. But you can also make that argument about a restaurant. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Everything you said is correct, but the same argument could be made by anybody who produces a product or a service designed to attract customers. A, a restaurant, a chef wants people coming back as often as possible. A John Carr speech is designed to engage you um, and then get you to invite him to come back. I, I, I'm serious, that, that while that is true, of course people who design games want them to be compelling I, I ride bicycles, and if the more experienced bicycle riders ride longer rides and climb higher hills, and nobody calls that addiction, even though it could be uh, harmful. So I just think we need to put this in the context of the analog world, which essentially has exactly the same components. Let's see what Patrick has to say about that. So yeah, it's probably a good point to jump in with the point of view um, from the people that, that make these games. Um, I think the first thing to tackle there is there's a bit of a conflation um, between what uh, people who build products for children, like ourselves, and then products that exist for a general audience or a wider audience or even older audience that children have access to. Um, and quite often they're a lot less fun for children, so you have to build in entirely different incentives to bring them back. And suddenly you're designing off in that direction. Um, and, and you're doing things like Snapchats, streaks, etc., which is trying to get them to come back into the restaurant constantly. But what we do is we try and provide a quality meal that somebody will pay up front for. So they, they, there's a nice point of transaction between them um, and us, which shows what they're getting, how, how nice it's going to be, generally going to be reviews about that. Um, whereas the, the other side that I was talking about is, is to, to more to your point, um, it's almost like telling people, you don't need three meals a day, you need six, or you need ten. And I think at that point, it is problematic. I think, you know, you, you, it's obvious that you would have problems with obesity if you could even fit that inside you in a day. Um, so I think we need to be very conscious about who we're talking about when we think of these people going off and designing in these crass measures to keep children in games. Um, we, we don't get asked to make things addictive. Um, I won't butcher David Kleeman, our uh, SVP of Global Trends um, speech, but he has a great speech about um, addictiveness and then how quite a lot of people who are providing content for children aren't looking for that. It's, it's not the thing we're trying to do. We're trying to make sure that the parents come back rather than the children and the parents can see the value that we're adding to the child's life. Um, but I think, I think Quite clearly, it's not just parents that have a role to play. They are the nexus of the child's life and caretakers, so grandparents, etc. Um, but industry does have a part to play, and, and we should not shirk that responsibility. Um, in fact, talking about how VR earlier, virtual reality earlier, affects children and how we don't know what the effects are. Um, as part of our responsibilities, we created a research paper called CVR, Children and Virtual Reality. Um, and for tablets, when tablets were becoming a thing, we created TAP, um, Tablets and Play, um, I think that stands for. And so each time we do this, each time we go into a new area or a new, in, uh, new part of the industry, we ourselves feel a, a pulling responsibility to go and make sure that we're doing the right things for these children and building the right things. Because at the end of the day, nobody's going to come back and our parents not going to pay if you're delivering something that's low quality and, and bad for their children. Um, eventually, parents will, will vote with their feet. Um, and we can, we can see that coming with things like advertisements on microtransactions where it's not obvious um, and, and parents eventually realize that actually, while this might have been a free app, um, there is a payment somewhere down the road. 
Thank you, Martin. You wanted to add. Yes, yeah, sure. And uh, just that I'm fully conscious I'm not a child, children psychologist or anything in that. I'm really coming from the youth side of things and the need that uh, technology uh, should not deceive and, and, and in a way also uh, with vulnerable uh, stakeholders we may have some responsibility in protecting them against uh, things. In general it's already true on what we expect from users to do in terms of protecting their computers, their online uh, uh, presence, their, their data. Uh, if we look to this problem, I hear a lot about addiction and that's a problem that's in itself. And yes, indeed, uh, it's a problem in which uh, responsibility may not be with the, the producer of the goods, the, 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 the offer of the services, yet we know there's also legislation that says, well, particularly to our children, we shouldn't advertise under the skin uh, during screen time. And I guess this uh, could apply for uh, games too. Uh, simple measures that may work, that's the other warning I would want to give, that may work in your country, may not work in other countries. Screen time and how it's used is as important as the screen time in itself. Uh, if we say we limit the screen time to four hours and I want to game, uh, then I don't want to make my homework on the screen, if that also counts in the same time. Uh, the good news is technology can help, it uh, can make you more aware. Um, this thing tells me now every week how much screen time I had per week. And uh, <laughs> I pay attention to that and I'm shocked by that sometimes, uh, realizing it's not my only screen. Uh, the other thing is that uh, also in terms of using this again in a car, you can install an app that helps you not to use it while you're driving. Similar applications are possible for children too. Uh, I've, my personal feeling as a parent is that a lot of this responsibility lay, lays with the parent. And offering those tools is certainly something technology can do and should do. Thank you. Jasmina, you want to inter intervene? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Yasmina Bern. I work with UNICEF and uh, I've, I've been working in, in children and digital as a researcher first. Now I'm in a policy division in New York for, for many years and uh, we've never been so polarized as now, particularly when it comes to child rights and digital technologies. There's so many different opinions about the well-being of a child who uses the, the technologies, the screen time. Uh, we hear the pros and, and the cons, and it's not really easy to, to, to make any uh, kind of an informed judgment about what is good for children and what is not. And uh, I often see uh, panel studies that um, interview 2,000 children at one point in time and then make broad generalization about the, the positive impact or a lack of negative impact of technologies on children. And I, I just want to say that, I mean, we all agree here that there are obviously some uh, very positive things about technology. There are also things that can affect the brain development, uh, sleep patterns, how much time uh, children spend on recreation, other activities, on doing homework, socializing in real life. Um, and and we, we still really don't know enough. And I, I just want to make a, a, a call for all of you particularly private sector, to open up their data because even if when we do this research with children, they will tell you things, they, uh, they, it's self-reported, they will tell you things that you want to hear, they will say, no, I don't have a negative impact, but we don't really know what they do online unless we have real-time data, unless the private sector, the companies open up uh, their data and share with researchers, with policymakers, and with everybody else so that we can really get a proper insight in what is happening to children. And I would call for more data and more research that is longitudinal, that looks at, uh, at the longer term impact of technologies. By then, obviously, we'll have new technologies and then we'll have to study them as well. Uh, and, and, and obviously, uh, including, as John was mentioning, uh, other stakeholders, but also other disciplines, uh, like the, the neuroscience that produced all these results about how the brain develops in adolescence, can we bring some neuroscientists to the table to tell us more about what is happening to a child's brain due to the use of technologies or not? 
So just a, a few points to say that uh, this is great to see that there is such a debate about this, but uh, we hope that we can really all try to clarify more about what is good, what is bad. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one minute, please, because we have two more minutes and we have to wrap up. Thank you so much. Uh, I keep saying, I keep listening that is about all about uh, limiting screen time and also uh, addiction and it seems like there are some kind of connection between and I think that it is more important than uh, limiting their screen time because uh, no one wanted to be controlled as well as the children. In the age of the childhood, they are developing their self-independence or in uh, their uh, self-discipline. So maybe I think that other methods that I was at, that is not only focusing on controlling their time or limiting their time is better than uh, the time that limiting their screen time because they are still developing. So I just want to ask how do you, how is how is that sounds like? Thank you. Thank you very much. John or you I don't know. One of you wants to answer. So I think that's what a lot of parents are a lot of parents are doing that. Um, I guess part, the part of this is, and, and you're agreeing with me, that actually in the long run, for, even for the games manufacturers, it's not good business if you design games that have a bad effect on children. M my worry is that not, not all companies use Dubbit. The, the, there are a lot of flyboys, as we used to call them. That probably There's probably a better phrase for that now, but there are a lot of uh, fly-by-night companies that are doing games that are not designed in that kind of healthy way and they are designed in, in a way to keep you there the maximum period of time. Yeah, really quickly on that, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, so the way we, we do that, and, and it, it might not be true that other people don't do it in industry, we quite often find when they don't, it's because they're not children specific again. Um, and, and kids specialists actually do, do give a, a good try and a good go, but it's, we, we consider everything user experience. Um, even down to security, so a lot of people think security isn't user experience, but um, I'm damned if I, I'll feel an experience if I find out my data has been leaked on something that I use, um, and you'll feel the same if your child is using you know, an app of ours and you find out data has been leaked or used in the wrong way. So we, f we feel not just that we need to do this altruistically, but there are pressures where, where we should be doing this from parents um, I think the, th the important thing, to go back to your point, is, is parents struggle because there's not enough guidance. Um, I think there needs, to be, there needs to be more pushes towards them being literate. Um, they need to be more aware that they can demand things of us, of industry, and, and the direction we go in. Um, like I said, voting with their feet, making sure they're using the right kind of apps, um, and making sure the right kind of apps that are built for their children. Um, it is very important because industry will respond to that much quicker um, than guidelines um, or, or discussions. Uh, I take that as a final remark and that it's a very good one uh, because we have to wrap up. Uh, John, do you want to say a final line? Do you tell Martin? Yes, I, I do want to uh, add something. I, I'm really grateful for just Mina to remind us of children's rights because in this debate, we have to have in mind that children's children, <coughs> sorry, have a right to be protected, but also they have their right to freedom of expression, to access to information, to peaceful assembly, participation, and so on and so on. And all this takes place via digital media. So it's important to have that in mind. When, when we discuss about who should take responsibility, I do think, of course, we we have a multi-stakeholder approach. We need all the actors uh, in the room to, to shoulder their share of responsibility. But we also need to differentiate because uh, it cannot be part of the role of the parents alone to, to, to solve that problem. Uh, that is not only due to the fact that not all parents are up to it, even though they are up to to some of the, the tasks they have to perform in educating their children, there is also a part that just cannot be done by the parents, and that is in the responsibility of, of industry. And I, 
do think that at that point it's not fair to, to draw the parallel to riding a bike or climbing a mountain and so on because at that uh, area parents can decide for their children. They will know that it might not be appropriate to swim for five hours a day for a child in, in the swimming pool or so on and so on for health reasons. But when using digital devices, there is something behind that parents cannot overlook, but that companies can overlook. And when we educate our children, and many of the, of the uh, media education people in the room, they know, okay, we've educated over years and years that children do not provide their private data. They do not talk about which school they attend, where they live, where their house is. They are, the children have learned these lessons. But now with all these devices, it's a different kind of data. It's not what the children provide, but what the provider of the game, of the service, knows about their children's usage behavior. And these data are the important data that no parents can take, take responsibility for, but the company needs to take responsibility. And what Jasmina said, you can learn from these data. If companies would open up what they know about user behavior, how long children use the games, how they interact in the evening other than in the morning. These data would be of utmost uh, well-being to decide about screen time and everything else. So I, I do think we need more cooperation. We need to have access to this data, not, not me, but researchers that are working in that field to learn more about the impact the usage have on the children. And then we can also develop educational strategies. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So uh, I will give one minute to um, two members of the Dynamic Coalition, uh, Larry and Janice. They wanted to make a, a very short amount announcement on an initiative that they're launching. Please, uh, we have one minute and also thanking all the participants. It has been very useful, I hope, for you and for us. We've learned a lot and thank the speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Law. Well, firstly, I would like to say we have spoken about how important it is that young people use these new tools to speak, to uh, express themselves. We did a, a study, well, we did a consultation with almost 5,000 young people on the GDPR when they really expressed themselves. One thing that they said is that they're sick and tired of answering on the themes that we as adults choose. So over to you, Larry, to explain our new initiative to get kids on board. So we have launched a website, which we're announcing today, called smarterinternet.org, smarterinternet.org. And on it is an explanation of this new project. And the idea is to create a consultancy in multiple countries where children actually design the questionnaire. So the the, what we're passing out now, the poster, is mostly, I'm not sure we're passing out, is mostly blank. Uh, we have some suggestions, but the idea is for children to create their own questions. So we start with either focus groups or individual meetings in various countries, and we've already had one in the US. Janice has had a, a few around Europe, to get the children to say what are the issues that concern them, either by filling out this form or more likely speaking openly about what concerns them and having someone taking notes. And from that, we will develop a questionnaire. The first implementation would be what I'm going to call an unscientific survey, probably on something like uh, SurveyMonkey, to get thousands of children to indicate what they believe are the priorities. We may, if we can afford to, follow it up with a scientific survey just to validate it. But again, as Janice pointed out, getting the young people to define what are the issues and getting their peers to validate exactly what the issues are. From this, we hope on Safer Internet Day to at least have some initial data, and then later in the spring, have a more thorough report, which would be available within the individual countries and globally. And I don't know if I left anything Thank you out. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you.